youth tear upon the core of blasphemy. Follow your prophet, and on evil make a victory. Let our righteousness be a role model to our children, making new generations of believers decently upbringing with parents as an example. As gems we shape them, fearing only Allah, devoting our lives for Him. Bismillah, assalamu alaikum, peace. Welcome to Closing the Gap. I'm your host, Omar Dunlap. We have with us, of course, Sheikh Yusuf Estes. Welcome. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalamu wa rahmatullah. Sheikh, in the previous episode, we were talking about the gap between belief and unbelief. We mentioned, basically, evolution and creationism. Uh, maybe in this episode, we can start moving more towards what kind of beliefs are out there. So I was wondering if you could elaborate on that for us. One of the things that we want to insist on is that we don't claim that people have to believe what we believe. Mm. We don't. That's never been the case in Islam. But what we do like to do is present evidences for what we say. One of the most important parts of Islam that I found when I came into it is the idea of proving what you say. If you say Islam is this or Islam is that, it teaches this, the Quran says that, or some hadith, the first words to come back to you are a challenge. Even from your own friends, your teachers, even your students are supposed to challenge you. Where is your proof? And this is not just something accepted. It is encouraged in Islam. Mm -hmm. Ask for proof. Prove to yourself without a doubt what is being said. In one of our programs, we spoke about Imam Bukhari and the way he developed this scientific way of proving. One of the things that we found is that the very structure of finding evidence for Scotland Yard in England, the fam most famous of crime fighters, maybe, right. you know, in history, mm -hmm. is Scotland Yard. They use the same technology and standard the same way as Imam Bukhari did in his discovering the truth behind these hadiths. Mm. Additionally, we find that eBay on the Internet uses again this same structure to prove something. It's when you test something again and again and again and it keeps coming up true. Mm. Now, there are others, now there's more than just true and false. In between, and this is where eBay and criminology and Bukhari work. And that is, you'll find something could be absolutely true or something's absolutely false. But then there are different categories in between where you're not as sure. Mm. Mm. And so this is what's important to help you form your opinion. Mm. What's absolutely sure is you exist or you wouldn't be there thinking. That's a sure. No doubt. Mm. But do I really exist? Mm. Hmm? Mm. Now that's pretty sure. But there's a possibility this is a dream. Hmm. Possibility this is an illusion. Possibility that somebody's fooling you. This is a television program, so maybe this part was recorded and that you're over there as a robot. Hmm. Or, you know, there, there are these possibilities. Not very logical ones, right. I might add. Right. But the first thing is to take what you are sure of. Okay? And then the other thing is take what you're positive isn't true. Okay. Mm. Then what are the categories in between? And this is called belief. Mm. This is what's the belief system. Take what you're most sure of. And this is what Islam is teaching us. What you're the most sure of. What doesn't make you doubt. Look what Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said about it. Mm. He said that what is permissible in Islam, you can do it. This is the permissible. And it's clear. Mm. What is forbidden in Islam, you can't do that. And it's clear. He said, now, in between, there are areas of doubt. Leave what makes you doubt for that which doesn't make you doubt. Mm. Go from the doubtful to the less doubtful. More doubtful, less doubtful. Until you are as much as you can be toward that which is absolute fact. Mm. In other words... Uh the best method of going through life is to say, uh, is this thing that I'm being told here true? If it is, I'll keep it. If it's not, I'll put it on the back burner for a little while. 
Is that more or less what you're... Or in a trash can. Uh, or either one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If you're sure it's no good, don't even save it anymore. Right. Right. Yeah. I'll give you an example of some of these things. When I grew up, I believed, as all children do, they believe what's being told to them by their parents first. Mm. The parents are the first to have an influence on a child. And then after the, the parents is going to be the teachers or preachers. Whatever belief system the parents have, they're going to introduce their children to it, right? So then the relatives and the immediate circle of friends and contacts the child have influence them from the beginning. Mm. This is mentioned by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in a hadith, where he tells us that every child is born on the fitra of, of al-Islam. Now, what he means by that is the natural inclination is to be in a state of submission or surrender and peace. That's the natural way of a child. He said, he continued by saying, he's born in that condition, but then his parents will cause him to become a Jew, a Christian, a fire worshiper, and the list goes on. But you can see that's exactly what we find today. Mm. That many people are influenced by their parents or their upraising, their background, causes them to believe or disbelieve on whatever level it might be. So the biggest impact is coming from that. Mm -hmm. Which means when you're old enough to go back and think, you need to reevaluate those circumstances. Because it's obvious that somebody in India who's a Buddhist is not the same as somebody in India who is a Hindu. Now, why are they both in the same country with two different beliefs? Mm -hmm. How could that be? Mm -hmm. Well, because they were raised that way. We find also Muslims and Christians in that same country. And each of them believing what they grow up in. And there's not much chance that they're really going to consider the other options unless there's some kind of evidence, proof or stimuli to move them from this to that. Mm. Make sense? Right. Okay. So now, how do we determine what's the most correct belief? Now, I want to be critical of what I believe. Let me look at the people who presented the material. Again, that's what Imam Bukhari did. That's what eBay does. That's what Scotland Yard does. They examine the one presenting the evidence and then they make their decision whether or not they're ta telling you the fact or not. No. And how do I determine this? Well, let's go back and look at my mom and my dad. Mm. They're honest people. They're good Christians. I know that about them. But one day, I was about eight, nine years old, I came bouncing home from school in December. Mom, 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 what's the matter? She's washing dishes. Mom, do you know what they said at school today? She said, what? I said, that they said there's, that the kids said there's no Santa Claus. Hmm. There's no Saint Nicholas. Hmm. She didn't even look up. She just kept washing dishes. She said, don't tell your sisters. Hmm. I I was like, my mother went over to the dark side. <laughs> she no longer believes in Santa Claus. <laughs> oh, my God. Mm. That would mean, oh, no, no, couldn't be. If she's telling the truth, no way. No, 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 no. But that would mean my grandmother lied, and she never lies. She'll whip you if you lie. Mm. So why would she whip me for lying if she's lying? No, there's Santa Claus. It has to be. <laughs> but wait a minute, my grandfather wouldn't lie. Hold on a second. I know what I'll do. On Christmas Eve, I stayed in the, in the living room, <laughs> pretended I fell asleep on the couch, laying there with my head toward the couch so they couldn't see if my eyes were open or not. Kept listening, listening. My mother said, well, shall we wake him up and put him to bed? You know, my dad said, I'll let him sleep. She said, well, how will we get the stuff out? Mm. She, he says, ah, he's old enough to know by now anyway. If he wakes up, if not, who cares? Let's just get the stuff out and get done. Mm. And I was laying there crying, mm. realizing my parents had lied to me. And then they brought out the Christmas presents, put all the stuff. I didn't move till they were gone. They went to bed. Mm -hmm. And when I rolled over and looked, I saw it. There was a bicycle. There was a drum set. There was a lot of toys and gifts. But I wasn't happy with it at all. Mm -hmm. Because it was not a result of what I'd been told. No fat man came down the <laughs> chimney. Ho, ho, ho. And there's no reindeer on the roof. And there's no, what was it, Rudolph with the red nose. <laughs> it's all a lie. Mm -hmm. And I was still upset because now my father's gone over to the dark side. 
And I look, there's Santa Claus's handwriting. I recognize it because I see it every year. But I suddenly realize how much it looks like my mother's handwriting. Mm. From Santa. Mm. So then it's time for confrontation. Let me go to them and ask them direct. Dad, yes or no, is there a Santa Claus? Uh, there's the spirit of Santa Claus. I said, what do you mean? The spirit of giving. I said, spirit? What are you talking about? Spirit. Is there a Santa Claus? Is there a guy in a red suit coming down our chimney or not? Nah. Mm. Then why do we represent that? Why, we tell, why don't we tell people about the spirit? He said, ah, the kids, they have a lot of fun with it. Mm. Wasn't fun for me. Mm. It's fun so I've asked many times when I'm giving speeches in universities, in large gatherings, I ask them, have you ever been lied to by your parents? No, of course not. My parents wouldn't lie. What about society itself? Do you find any lies? No, not at all. <laughs> I'm telling you, your parents have lied to you. Your pastor has lied to you. Your teachers have lied to you. Your dearest and darling friends have lied to you. And they say, no way. I say, okay, then how old were you when you found out there was no Santa Claus? Mm. And they're shocked. And then how long before you're going to ask the question, does that mean there's really no Easter bunny going around laying colored eggs? <laughs> so we find a huge discrepancy because this is something that's around the world. We even find it in non-Christian countries being celebrated. Now, obviously, a Jew wouldn't be too interested in this subject, would he? I mean, they don't buy into the idea of, of Christmas because they don't believe in Christ. Right. But absolutely, you'll find it even in Jewish homes. Somebody will bring a Christmas tree, give some Christmas present. If they're not Orthodox, they may do that. Mm. So we're finding it Hindus, Buddhists, even atheists who don't believe in God at all. Still, ah, what the heck, you know, put the tree in there, which, by the way, is a symbol of another religion, the Celtic religion, believing in God being in nature and trees, which in the Bible curses that, tells you not to do it. And well, that's subject to maybe another time, mm. book of Jeremiah chapter 10. But as you look at these different beliefs and non-beliefs and all of them celebrating this Christmas, even Muslims. Yeah. When I was in Malaysia, they were putting up one of the biggest Christmas trees <laughs> inside the Petra Towers mm. where we did a Bridge to Faith show. Right. And I'm thinking, Bridge to Faith, why am I bothering in a country where they're putting a huge Christmas tree <laughs> for Muslims? Right. Yeah. SubhanAllah. Right. Well, uh, Sheikh, we're going to go to a quick break and we'll be right back. So don't go anywhere. You're watching Closing the Gap. Fearing only Allah, devoting our lives for Him. Hopefully we'll discuss some, some tips on, on how to increase the, the ability of getting the du'a or the supplication answered. Allah delays giving you what you want and gives you a reward that is equal to that or better in this life or in the world to come uh, for giving you your sins and giving you good deeds. I'm going to look at some questions that we've asked some of our brothers on the street. Uh, we asked them, should Muslims have a dialogue with other religions? We're going to need some stability. So. We, uh, it doesn't matter where we live, we need to care for those ones to give them the rights that Allah gives. This life is not the eternal life, it is a test. Particularly for the youth of today. So if there are any parents or uncles or whoever is watching, if you have 16, 17, 18, 20 year olds with you, make sure they stop doing whatever they're doing and come in and watch this show, inshallah. <laughs> Bismillah, assalamu alaikum, welcome back to Closing the Gap. I'm your host, Omar Dunlap. We have with us Sheikh Yusuf Estes, assalamu alaikum. Alaikum, assalamu alaikum. Uh, Sheikh, just before the break, we were discussing the gap between belief and unbelief, and you started talking about verifying. Uh, what you believe. And you even mentioned Santa Claus and brought everything into this. So I was wondering if you could just elaborate on that for us, inshallah. What I want to do now is to be a little less uh, concise on just a, more of a general term. 
about believing and disbelieving. Mm. When you have an evidence, a testable evidence that proves to be true once, this should immediately alert your attention. Let's look to another evidence. If it's again true, second time, that's very solid. And by the time you get to the third evidence, again confirming the first one, and you don't have anything against it, this is pretty much a fact until you can find something else. Isn't that right? Right. Islam teaches believers to always move to the thing that has the most proof. And if somebody's religion has more proof than what we have, we're ready to go to it. But obviously we already know it won't. But that's the conclusion that I came to and was the biggest motivator for me to really start reconsidering my position as a quasi-Christian or whatever I was at the time. Mm. I won't claim to be the perfect Christian because I also don't claim to be the perfect Muslim either. Mm. But I do know that in life you have to make decisions on your own at some point. It's up to you to choose what you want to believe. Islam does not force you. In fact, that's the key to Islam itself is that you are not forced. Allah does not force people to believe in Him. That's why He created everything the way He did. So it's always the option. You could always say, well, maybe it's not. Go ahead. Mm. But it'll be to your own chagrin at the end. Because there are too many evidences, real solid proofs for what Islam teaches. Mm -hmm. Now, not being a Muslim, criticizing Islam and trying to convert Muslims to Christianity, obviously, I wouldn't have listened to that at the time, I would have considered that's just nonsense. I, won't, I don't want to listen. Right. Except that certain proofs became evident and then I had to make a choice. Accept those proofs or reject them. Now, had I rejected them, then I would be one who covers the truth. And we mentioned that before in the program. That is called kafir. Hmm. You see the truth, but you deny it. You are clearly denying a proof in front of your face. I suggest to a person that's not sure about Islam, you're not really sure, whether you were born in a Muslim family or not, doesn't guarantee that you're a Muslim. Mm. And I suggest to those who are looking at Islam, thinking about becoming a Muslim, or somebody might be a new Muslim out there. Somebody might be thinking, I don't like Islam, but still I want to know about it. Fine. What I would suggest, get a copy of the Quran, if you know Arabic, it's the best. Read it in the Arabic language. If not, you're going to be depending on translations. I highly recommend that you sit with scholars of Islam to help you understand the Arabic from this. But anyway, chapter 55. This is where you want to go. The speed limit in the United States, now pretty much 55. Mm. Go look up 55. And you'll find from the very beginning to the end, it's constantly challenging the mind, both from us and from the jinn, the, mm. the creation, we didn't talk about this, of jinn who have been here even before humans. They exist. We can't see them. Some people call them ghosts or demons, uh, extraterrestrials, mm -hmm. etc. Islam is saying for sure they exist. For the most part, we don't communicate with them. But here is a chapter saying for all you guys, mm. the alameen, challenging them and calling them liars. Mm. If you don't believe this proof, you're a liar. Mm, and what are some of the examples that it gives? Starting in about verse 12 or so, I think it is. You'll start finding one verse after another after another, showing you an evidence. Go check it out. Mm. Go look where the Bahar, the Bahrain come together. The two seas, they come together, but they don't really join. They have two different levels of salinity. They have two different pressures within them. They have two different life forms, two different vegetation forms, two different temperatures. And there's this wall right there. Jacques Cousteau mentions this at one time in some documentary they were doing. And that he supposedly discovered this. And one of them exists off the, the tip of the Cape of Africa. Mm. Um, and you can see it. I have seen the two color forms in this. This is like a line going out there, and it's been there forever. Oh. Somebody can say, well, maybe Muhammad saw this. Mm. Well, there's no record of him ever going there. Mm. He lived in the desert. <laughs> it's not exactly the same. But right. another is what happens where the sea, the Mediterranean Bahar, feeds out into the Atlantic, 
And you'll find it again, the same thing there. You can see uh, on a, gra a graph, you can see almost like this big, looks like a huge tongue sticking out mm. where it comes. And it never really mixes. Mm. Another place is where the Mississippi River goes into the Gulf of Mexico. Mm. And you will find this, what they call brackish water. It isn't really salt water, but it isn't really fresh water. You sure don't want to drink it. Mm. And, it and it's... It doesn't really mix. It doesn't flow in like you might imagine it would. Mm -hmm. So how is this and how do you reconcile it? This has been a topic of discussion for scientists who have concluded, well, the Quran is correct about this. Mm. Well, maybe it's an accident. Okay, then go to the next verse and see again. Well, actually, you have to skip a verse because every other verse, Fabi Allah says, so which of the <clears throat> favors of your Lord will you guys then deny? So it says you're denying it. Yeah, you're denying it. it actually, Kadib is a liar. Oh. You're lying about it. Oh, wow. Not just denying. You're lying. Because mm. here's a proof. And now you're going to lie about it? Mm -hmm. And he talks about so many different things. The pearl and the corals. He talks about that. Mm. And then he talks... But Let me just go to one of my favorite ones. Let's come to this one. Chapter 55, verse 33. 5533. Three, three. Easy to find. You won't forget this one. Inshallah, God willing. And here he says, O oh, you assembly of mankind in jinn, okay, human beings and extraterrestrials or whatever, why don't you guys come together, all of you come together, and try to go outside of the atmosphere of the earth. Try it. And you will never, ever, ever go outside of earth's atmosphere. Mm. Ilibi Sultan. These two last words are the clearest proof to me that that's a big fact in here. Because back then, space travel was what? Well, let me give you a clue. When I was born in the 40s, space travel was a joke. Mm. They had Buck Rogers back then, oh, yeah. which was about as real as Superman, you know? <laughs> yeah. And talking about going out into space and doing all these things and traveling in a rocket ship. And it was a, a real joke. Mm. People used to say the man in the moon. Mm. Why don't you take a, a walk to the moon? Things right. like that. Mm. Then all of a sudden we find in the 50s uh, th they're talking about Russia is going to put a satellite, a Sputnik. They called mm. it a Sputnik. And we didn't have a word for it. We were trying to use their word and then we said, no, we got to give our own word for that because we want to be first in space. You know, We even have a slogan at NASA, first in space. How? <laughs> they beat it, but that's beside the point. Right. Anyway, so from there they're saying that they're going to put a man on the moon. Mm. Whoa! Now we've got to get all our energy together and get a man on the moon. But hold on, just to get out there to put the satellite, you broke the atmosphere. Now does that prove that verse is wrong? Mm. Well, let's go back and find out those last two words. What does illa mean? It means except. You'll never do it except be sultan. Sultan is authority or power. Mm. Whoever is in power over a group, he's the sultan. Mm. We call it sultan in mm. English. In English yeah. So what is the kind of power we're talking about? What is this great, huge power? Well, when you buy fuel for your automobile, how do you buy it? Mm. What quantities? You buy it by the liter mm. or do you buy it by the gallon? doesn't America. matter, yeah. and you pay too much for it. We all agree to that, right? right? But when you buy fuel for one of these rocket ships, have you ever seen how those rocket ships work? Have you, you looked at the ones at NASA? Oh, yeah. the, this rocket here, but it's got these two huge cylinders on the mm -hmm. side of it. Mm -hmm. That's the fuel. Mm -hmm. How do they measure it? Gallon or metric ton or how? I would think tons. I think you yes. a lot of it. Yeah. It's not liter. It's not gallon. It's by the tons. Mm -hmm. They're putting tons and tons and tons of fuel, of liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. I worked at NASA for some period of time in that area back in the 60s mm. when they were cleaning these pipes to run liquid oxygen through. If there's one crumb of carbon in there, it will blow up. And that was our job to clean it out. Mm. Now, I know for a fact that it was tons and tons of fuel just to put that thing to get it up. And then it has to have its own fuel after those cylinders break off to push it the rest of the way. Mm. Mm. Illa be Sultan. And there you have it.
There's no way to do that. Even now, even by using different forms of shooting it out and having a plane that will come back on a re-entry basis, and it still takes tons and tons of fuel to get it up there. Right. Well, Sheikh, we have about a minute left, so I would like to give you the opportunity to give our viewers some closing thoughts. As much as I would insist that you should look to these evidences provided from the teachings of Muhammad, teachings of the Quran, I will tell you before you go that far, there's an evidence inside of yourself. You can start right there. All you have to do is look inside your own heart. And if you're willing to clean it out, if you're willing to get rid of bias and prejudice, if you're willing to say, I really don't know, but I'm willing to learn, and you're willing to open the heart up and say, God, if you're there, guide me, then what comes after that could be very enlightening. Well, that's all the time we have for us today. We would like to encourage our viewers to be sure and catch us next time on Closing the Gap. Until then, I'm your host, Omar Dunlap, wishing you peace. Assalamu alaikum. Oh, you tear upon the core of blasphemy. Follow your prophet and on evil make a victory. Let our righteousness be a role model to our children Making new generations of believers Decently upbringing With parents as an example As gems we shape them Fearing only Allah Devoting our lives for Him